welcome everyone to this uh, fifth and last lecture of this little series. Thank you for coming again. I really appreciate it. The topic of today's discussion and lecture is uh, the independence hierarchy, and in particular, the status of the independence concepts in algebraic quantum field theory. And here's the outline of the lecture. I have already claimed, and it is true, that there is a whole bunch of independence notions in uh, algebraic quantum mechanics. And it's very easy to get lost in this maze of different independence concepts. But it is helpful to keep in mind that there is a core idea of independence which gets specified in different ways, in different formulations in terms of algebraic quantum mechanics. And I will start by describing this general idea of independence, because once you have this general idea, it's much easier to understand and comprehend the whole hierarchy. Once we have this general idea, I will specify this general idea according to the literature in many different ways. So I will just recall, review different standard independence notions, and we will see that they are just really versions, different versions, different technical specifications of the same general idea. And of course, if you have a series of definitions, a list of definitions, then the question arises as to what the relation, the logical relation, among the different uh, independence concepts are. And then I will present you some results on this issue. Not all, I'm not even familiar with all, it is such a huge topic. But the, the major results which are known about the interdependence of the independence notions will be presented here. So that's the third issue. Once this is done, I turn my attention to the notion of operation, and I will make several comments, recall some well-known facts about operations. And I do this uh, with the intention of defining a notion of independence, which is formulated in terms of operations. And here I'm recalling uh, concepts which I myself have helped to uh, design and will then present you a couple of uh, propositions about how this operational independence notion is related to the hierarchy of other independence. Once this is done, we turn our attention to a closely related notion called the notion of, uh, notion of operational separability. This is an independence concept whose origin go back, as I would claim, to Einstein's criticism of standard quantum mechanics. We will see how. And then I will relate these two notions to each other, and I will ask what the status of this operational separability is in algebraic quantum field theory. And we will see uh, that uh, just like operational independence, operational separability holds typically in quantum field theory. Once this is done, I will put an extra twist on the notion of operational independence and operational separability by specifying further subclasses of these notions, which lead to new questions about the relation of uh, different subclasses of operational separability and independence concept, about which essentially nothing is known, so there's a lot of open problems I will present you with a diagram which shows how much is not known about the relation, logical relation of these different notions. So this is the plan, quite a long plan, plan and I have 58 slides. I hope I can flash all of them. If you are running out of time, I will skip some. The main message, in every lecture there is a main, simple main message, and I hope you don't mind the simplicity of the main messages, which I have 
uh, designed uh, at the beginning of all lectures. And the main message here is also very simple, namely that there is a very rich hierarchy of interdependent, non-equivalent, independent notions in algebraic quantum field theory. And the local systems associated with space-like separated space-time regions in the sense of the local algebraic quantum field theory typically satisfy the strongest independence notion. So this is very reassuring as a message that algebraic quantum field theory is all right from the perspective of our intuition. Remember, the intuition is that this theory really embodies locality and causality in an intuitively uh, compelling fashion. Okay, so preliminary remarks on independence. Uh, this is partly repeating what I just said. These independence notions are crucial for the algebraic approach to quantum field theory because we intend to have a theory here which is complying with the causality principle understood along the lines of the special theory of relativity, that is to say, space-like separated systems should be independent. And our model, mathematical model, should reflect that independence. Okay, so that's what we expect and it's very important. The other preliminary remark is that the independence notions uh, the, independent, the situations in which we encounter this problem of independence is typically the situations in which we have two systems which can be regarded as part of a larger system. Just imagine two space-like separated open bounded regions, say cones, double cones. You can imagine the large double cone that uh, encloses, that contains both, so then the independence of these two systems is conceived of, is created as independence within the large system. This will be important, and this is typically the situation. Another preliminary comment is, and this is good to keep in mind, is that the notion of independence is not theory independent. There's no absolute notion of independence. You don't know what independence need is in abstract. Okay? There's no philosophical or physical or whatever notion of independence that would be independent of the special context in which you try to specify, okay? So uh, it's not a theory independent notion. And also it's good to know that it's not unique even if you fix a special context, as we will see very clearly, even if you fix your theory to be non-commutative probability theory, the notion of independence can be formulated in many different non-equivalent ways. And therefore, the interdependence of the independence notions is an interesting, emerging, and typically very difficult problem. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, what is the definition of the term, the notion of independence? Which, do you have some uh, super definition of some mathematical definition of the, each of these uh, hierarchies or something that you are needing basically uh, for uh, what you call independence? But the, I claim here there is no abstract notion of independence which would be uh, somehow independent of what your theory is. That's, that's the claim. But there is, in the special context in which we are encountering this in physics, in quantum physics in particular, a core idea which is informal, it's not specific, and in some sense it uh, encompasses all the other independence notions. But it's intuitive and it is not technical. When it comes to technical formulations, there are different technical formulations of essentially the same idea. But again, this idea, even this more general idea, is not uh, something which is uh, universal. That is to say, there are notions of independence which are not of the sort, not of the specification of the core idea which I'm presenting here. Just to give you an example, but, but it should become clear as we go along what this core idea is, and then when we see, once we see what the core idea is, we might want to think about 
other independent concepts which do not fall under this more general term of uh, concept of independence. For so example, the classical probability theory. Mm. Independence is usually uh, considered about the relation with, for, with its two events or two sub Boolean um, yes. uh, or two uh, random variables. Yes. And uh, in that case, the uh, independence, statistical independence, and which is characterized by uh, information about the one variable does not uh, change the probability uh, distribution of the other uh, variable. For example, if you use the base principle, you, you, your uh, information about the occurrence of the uh, results of the one experiment uh, does not uh, change your uh, posterior probability yes. from the prior probability. Yes. Uh, so this is one mm, clear definition uh, of the independence in classical probability theory. And there are lots of the research in uh, quantum generalization such kind of independence, for example, independence in uh, free probability theory or something like that. Uh, uh, how mm, your uh, notion of independence is uh, different or related to those uh, uh, research? Well, I, we will see this in the end. Well, um, first of all, there are standard notions of independence. Uh, which, again, I, I, okay, here, is, here is the claim again. There are lots and lots of independence notions in science. We have just described one in classical probability. There are ones in free probability theory. There are ones in operator algebra theory. There are ones in uh, logic. There are lots and lots of independence notions out there. That was my claim. Namely, there's no unique abstract notion of independence. The notion of independence is theory dependent. Once you fix your theory, you can design your independence notion within that theory. And that independence notion might not make sense in another context, or might not be formulable, uh, formulable in another context. So the, the point I'm making here is that you should not think of the independence as a uniquely fixed notions somehow. There are different sorts of independence notions, even if you are in the same theory. For instance, if you're in classical probability theory, there's this uh, popular statistical independence notion you just described. But of course, there is the Boolean algebra there on which the probability measure is defined. And one can define, as we have seen uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, you can define logical independence which doesn't refer at all to probabilities. It only refers to the Boolean operations, which are part of probability theory. So you have, even there, two different independence notions. And the, the point I'm making here is that this is typical. The independence notion is not unique. It is theory dependent. There are many of them. And it is a reasonable question to ask how they are related. Now, and this is what I'm going to talk about. Now, you might want to say that some of the independence notions are more attractive intuitively than others, which is some sort of a philosophical or interpretational question. Which independence notion do you think expresses better the causal independence of space-like separated regions? Well, this is a question which doesn't really have a unique answer, I believe. You might want to argue that say, logical independence in that particular case is much weaker in some intuitive sense than, say, uh, C-star independence. So I think the issue is, uh, is complex in the sense that there are no unique notions of independence, perhaps contrary to what one might have expected. And also, uh, the problem of which of the independence notions you prefer over the others that's a difficult and interpretational and philosophical question. 
For instance, we know, I claim from the first slide in the main message, that certain, that the strongest independence notions do hold in quantum field theory, typically, but not always. And you might want to say that you are unhappy about that. That this is a problematic theory, after all, because certain independence notions, the strongest one, do not hold in certain situations in quantum field theory. And then you might want to say, well, that theory is unfortunately contradicting our intuition or the special theory of relativity, a possible position to take. Okay, so this is this is the situation. I think the I, I like to know more categorical uh, sense. Uh, you, you you wrote that the independence of the space is like by the local system. So the, can I understand that uh, your notion of your notion of independence is something uh, for or two systems or two observables or two events or for, for what? You see, you are you are just confirming my point. One can talk about independence of systems. One can talk about independence of events. One can talk about independence of many other things, of probability measures, of state preparations. These are conceptually different ideas. And you might want to say, in the case of space-like separated systems, I expect independence in all three senses of what we have just specified. Events should be independent. Events should be logically independent. Events should be probabilistically independent. Systems should be independent. Preparations of states should be independent, and so on. And so this is this is a possible position to take that you expect all sorts of independence features to hold for that situation. And the question is, is this true? Is that expectation met? Does the theory satisfy these expectations, that is to say, does the theory satisfy these independence conditions? And the situation then is essentially that the answer to this question is yes, the theory satisfies the strongest independence condition, typically, not always, and this is the uh, issue which I, which I referred to previously, you might want to say that whenever, if, if, this is, if it is not the case that for all space-like separated systems, all independence concepts are valid, then we are unhappy about the theory. But if, if, if you are, this is, a, again, a philosophical issue. I don't see that I have satisfied your desire, but I, let me suggest that we go on a little bit and then we return to this issue at the end, okay? <laughs> Good, so here is the general idea of independence. I claim that there is a core idea of informal, informal idea, technically not explicit, but a core idea which is behind most of the independence notions which I'm going to present, which are standard in the literature, okay? And this is the subsystem idea of independence. Uh, so suppose you have two subsystems, S1 and S2, of a larger system, S. Then you would want to say that these two are independent if the following is the case. Anything which is possible in principle, theoretically, for, for the system S1 as a system in its own right, and anything which is possible in principle for the system S2 in its own right, are jointly possible in principle for the pair viewed as a subsystem of S. Let me illustrate this, this idea. Uh, again, this is an informal idea. Uh, and a very elementary example. Suppose I had a friend, okay? And uh, in this hot weather, we want to have a drink in the evening, and he, in his home, has a refrigerator which has, I don't know, Coke, Sprite, mineral water, whiskey, wine, beer. I have the same in my refrigerator. When do we say, when would we say that we, these two persons, are independent? When? Well, when if it is the case that no matter what he chooses from his fridge does not prohibit me from choosing anything from my fridge. That is to say, any two choices from the two refrigerators are possible 
as a state of the verb. Okay. That's when I, this is, this is the idea here. Then I would say that he is independent in his choice of me. Okay. That's the idea. Any two choices are co-possible, possible state of the verb. Okay. If he chooses coke, that, that does not prohibit me from choosing anything from my fridge. If he's choosing coke, would prohibit me from choosing, say, mineral water, then I would not call us in that the respect independent. Okay? So that's the that's the core idea. And I'm going to present you now specifications of this idea in the context of algebraic quantum. Is the first definition which we have already encountered. I very briefly uh, presented you this definition because, in connection with the violation of Bell's inequality, it was needed. Okay. The idea is here that if you have two C star subalgebras of the larger algebra, then any two partial states on the subalgebras have a joint extension of the large algebra. You see that it is the same, it, it is the manifestation of the same idea, of the core idea. Any two partial C star states can be jointly declared. Any two partial states uh, are a possible state of the large system. Okay? That's the idea. All right. Uh, second definition. A pair of C star subalgebra of the C star algebra C is called C star independent in the product sense if this map here extends to a C star isomorphism of the generated phenomenon uh, generated C star algebra in C by A1 and A2 with the minimal tensor product uh, of the two C star algebra. It's more or less obvious, more or less, but again, uh, in some sense, it's not obvious in how this relation, what the relation of C star independence in the product stands, is related to C star independence. It's more or less obvious that if this is the case, then separate states can be jointly extended because you, have, you, you just take the product state. Does the converse hold? Unclear. Again, you see immediately how the problem of the relation between different independence concepts emerges. Next definition, W star independence. Two von Neumann algebras of the von Neumann algebra M are called B star, w star independent if for any normal state on one of them and for any normal state on the other, there's a normal extension of them to the large one. So the idea is that any two partial normal states have a joint extension as a normal state. Next, W sign independence in the product sense. Two von Neumann algebras are W sign dependent in the product sense if for any normal state on one and any normal state on the other have a joint extension which is a product across the algebra. So any two normal states have a joint product extension. W star independence in the spatial product sense, which is very much like the C star independence in the product sense, namely, they are independent in this sense if this map extends to spatial isomorphism implemented on the, on the level of the state of the Hilbert spaces. Okay. Next one. Split property. A pair of von Neumann algebras are called split if there exists a type 1 factor EH such that the type 1 factor separates M1 from the commutant of M3. This is the commutant. The split property is uh, not immediately clear that it expresses an independent condition, but I will claim later on in the hierarchy that this is indeed the case. And although I, I'm unable to uh, detail this here, the split property is very important in algebraic quantum theory and in the operator algebra theory in general. It's a crucial, it's a crucial property. 
okay? But it's not, yeah, I'm just emphasizing its meaning, its significance as an independence property. Logical independence. Two phenomena algebras are called logically independent. If you just consider the two projection lattices, which are supposed to be regarded as logics of the system, um, and then it is the case that no matter how you take one projection from one and another projection from the other, if they are non-zero, their intersection is non-zero. We have encountered that in the Boolean setting yesterday, and I have mentioned this already today. This essentially means that any two non-self-contradictory propositions of the sum from the subsystems can be jointly true. The truth of any proposition on one system does not exclude the, proper, the truth of any other proposition on the other system. This is clearly an independence condition. Okay? Strict locality. A pair of non-nominal algebras acting in a Hilbert space satisfies strict locality if for any projection in one of the, uh, the projection like this is, there exists a normal, and, and uh, for any, every normal state, on the other, there exists a normal state on the large phenomenon uh, algebra such that the probability of the projection is one, and that normal state coincides with the normal state on the other algebra. So no preparation of any state on the subsystem represented by M2 can exclude the truth of any proposition on the other system, M1. Okay. I have presented you with a list of definitions. I hope you are a bit confused by seeing, if you, have, if you have not seen this before, then you should be confused. So those students here who have not seen this before and are confused by this list of definitions, are a bit confused, that's all right, because it's difficult to digest all this and comprehend what's going on. And in case, the issue emerges as to what the relation between these different independence concepts is. And I promise to you that I will present you some results on this. This has been subject of research in quantum field theory for a long time, and there are open questions still. And here are some results, some propositions. This picture, which I also flashed in the first lecture, if you remember, and I promise that I'm going to return to that. This is the time to detail a little bit what's going on. So here are the uh, different notions, and here are some of the known facts about them. Okay. I'm not detailing all, because I've not even left defined all of them, but most of them I have defined. The arrows mean entailment. Cross arrows means it's known that it is not entailed. Okay. C indicates that the commutativity of the sub-algebras is assumed. If you remember, all of the definitions concerned two sub-operator uh, algebras of a larger operator algebra, and I didn't assume that they are commuting. Okay? Now, you can assume it, and then that's an extra condition, and in some cases under these extra conditions, you can know something about the relation of the, of the independence conditions on such so here are some of the propositions. The split property is equivalent logically to the W star independence in the spatial product sense. And that's the, these are the strongest independence notions that entail W star independence in the product, stand, product sense, which is equivalent with the W star tensor product structure if you assume commutativity. That is to say, if W star independence in the product sense holds, and the two phenomena algebras are assumed to be commutative, then this is equivalent to saying that the two phenomena algebras uh, uh, generate the phenomena algebra, which is isomorphic to the tensor product of them. And this entails W star independence. But W star, w star independence does not entail W star independence in the product sense. So this is strictly stronger than W star independence. Recall W star independence was that any two normal states have a joint extension. 
Dobbyston independence in the product sense meant that any joint, any two normal states have a joint extension which is a product state across the budget. This is an extra condition and it is strictly stronger, it's a strictly stronger notion than Dobbyston independence. Dobbyston independence is equivalent to C star independence if the phenomenon algebras are assumed to be commuting. If they are assumed, if they are not assumed to be commuting, then doggy star independence is not entailed by C star independence. There are counter examples. Just a side remark, Jan Hamhalter, the Czech uh, quantum probability theorist, a very fine mathematician, is the expert on uh, the abstract uh, investigation of independence, not in the quantum field theory context. In the quantum field theory context, it's probably Stephen Summers who is the third leading expert on this. But in general, Jan Hamhalter from the Czech Public Technical University, he proved that the W star independence and C star independence is not equivalent uh, because if you don't assume the commutativity of the subalgebras, then W star independence is not entailed by C star. Okay, C star independence is entailed by the C star tensor product structure, C star independence in the product sense. The converse is not true, however. The C star independence in the product sense is strictly stronger than C star independence. W star independence entails strict locality. Converse is true on that you can assume assumption of commutativity, and they entail C star independence and the converse too, if the commutativity is assumed. C star independence is equivalent to logical independence if commutativity is assumed. But if commutativity, commuta that's not a good expression. Commut by commutativity, I mean that the two subalgebras are assumed to be commuting, but that's a too long wording, uh, uh, so I'm just saying commutativity. So C star independence is equivalent to logical independence if you assume that the subalgebras are commuting, but if they are not assumed to be, then uh, they are not equivalent. C star independence does not entail logical independence. Excuse me. Yes. Strict locality. Strict locality was defined here. Oops. So you pick a projection from one of the projection lattices and you fix a normal state on the other system, then there will be a normal state on B of H which makes that proposition true and which coincides with the normal state on the other algebra. So no preparation of any state on the subsystem represented by M2 can exclude the truth of any proposition on the other system. It's a kind of uh, well, this is it. So there are two systems. You make a proposition, you make a statement about, say, the value of, the, of an observable on one system, and you fix a state on the other. Okay. Then there will be a state of the large system which makes that proposition true and coincides with that state here on that. All right. So. Okay, you see, you see the conditions are uh, non-trivial, and that there have, I have presented you with I don't know 18 propositions, like roughly or or a sum. Anyway, no, what do you mean? Since that order to state. Okay, if they are if if two systems are sister independent, that means that if, however you choose one state here and another state there, they have a joint extension. Now, it is known that if this is the case, then the joint extension can be assumed to be a product state, okay? All right, and there is more. Uh, again, it's a huge topic. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, but I don't mind necessarily. Um, and uh, it has been topic of an intense research. There's a wonderful review paper by Stephen Summers, again, he's the leading expert on this. It, it was published in 1990, the review of, of mathematical physics. He summarizes uh, 
the independence uh, hierarchy beautifully. And there is more. There is even more I have not presented you with all which are known. And uh, I myself don't know everything in this field either. I would like now to turn to a specific notion of independence, which is relatively new, which I introduced, and uh, with Stephen Summers, and say something about this kind of uh, independence. Because I think it makes sense and it leads to new open questions. To do that, I will uh, say a few words about the notion of operation, which again, I assume is quite well known, so I, I can be very quick. I'm recalling some very standard uh, concepts and notions here. A CP map, a completely positive unit preserving map on, a, on, on an algebra is called an operation, and it's called a normal operation if it's continuous in the uh, algebraic topology if the algebra is a phenomenal algebra. And we know that the dual of an operation acts in the state spaces of these algebras, uh, maps the state space of the sister algebra into itself, and normal state states get mapped into normal states if the operation is normal. Examples of such CP maps, the notion of CP map or operation is quite general. It contains the notion of state. States can be identified with CP maps by this definition for any A in a sister algebra. You, you assign the expectation of A times the identity. This is an element of the algebra itself. And this, is the, this can be identified with the state itself. So states are known to be operations, completely positive maps, conditional expectations from an algebra into a subalgebra. It's a conditional expectation if it's linear uh, and if it's a projection onto the subalgebra. In particular, the conditional expectation, which is very familiar from standard quantum mechanics, the non-selective projection postulate, is a conditional expectation to that subalgebra. And these are all completely positive. These have to be proved not easy, or not difficult to prove. Good. The classic results on the notion of operation, <coughs> the most well-known is perhaps the Stein-Spring representation theorem. The Stein-Spring representation theorem says that if you have an operation from a C-star algebra into the set of all bounded operators on some Hilbert space, then it has a specific canonical form. This form, namely, where pi is a representation of the C star algebra A into uh, the bounded operators over some Hilbert space K. And K uh, is related to H, to this H, by uh, isomorphism. Okay, so all CP maps into the set of bounded operators over Hilbert space are of this form. It's a very useful representation theorem and uh, uh, used extensively in quantum information. This is very valuable in quantum information. A consequence of this theorem is uh, perhaps even better known. It's called the Krauss representation theorem. If you have a CP map, on a set of four bounded operators, uh, into the set of four bounded operators, then it has this particular form. If it's a normal operation, then it has this form, okay, where these Wi's are uh, summing up to one, and they are called the Krauss operators. This is really a corollary of this time space theory. All right, I assume that you know this very well. Comments on this, which are important. Very important, although by quantum information theorists who mainly work in the finite dimension of Hilbert space framework, not very well known. Uh, namely, that the uh, Krauss theorem characterizes operations on, the, on a very specific C star algebra, namely the set of all bounded operators. And the Krauss theorem is not true for arbitrary operations find an arbitrary C star or W star algebra. And this is because, uh, and this is related to another issue which, is, which makes life very difficult. 
if every operation on a C star or a W star algebra did have a graph representation, then every operation defined on any subalgebra, A naught of a C star algebra, would have an extension from the subalgebra to the large algebra, which is, however, not true. This makes the theory of operations, I believe, much more interesting than it is typically assumed to be. And it makes also life very difficult. Because if you don't have a representation of an object, then it's very difficult to compute it. Here's a famous theorem which characterizes maps, CP maps, which do have extensions from subalgebra to the uh, large algebra. Suppose you have a CP map which uh, is defined on a subalgebra A naught of a C star algebra A and which takes its values in the set of all bounded operators on a Hilbert space. Then that T can be extended from A naught to A to a C T map. That's a, called Arvison's theorem. It was proved in the 60s by the famous mathematician Arvison. And it's very important that uh, the range of T is B of H. It goes into B of H. And uh, it is a very strong assumption. And it's essentially uh, analogous to, uh, the, uh, to the situation of which represented by the states. If you have a state defined on a subalgebra of an algebra, then that state can always be extended. That's the content of the Hahnemann theorem. Okay. So B of H here behaves like the set of complex numbers behaves for states. But in general, this is not the case. That is to say, Arvison's theorem does not generalize to a general form of algebra in place of B of H. Uh, the related definition is the following. A C star algebra is called injective if the following is the case. If for any C star algebra A and for any C star subalgebra A not of A, it holds that if you have a CP map on the subalgebra into C, um, then uh, that CP map can be extended from the subalgebra into uh, a CP map on the large algebra. Okay. Again, an algebra is called injective if it is the case that no matter if you should take another algebra and a subalgebra of it and you define a CP map from the subalgebra into that one, then that map can be extended to the large one. So the Hahn-Van Achterian, which, uh, to which I alluded uh, a couple of minutes ago, uh, can be reformulated in this definition as this claim that the set of complex numbers as a commutative C structure is injected. And Arvison's theorem can be reformulated as the claim that the set of all bounded operators on a Hilbert space is injected. But not all algebras are injected. Okay? Which algebras are injective? This is a very deep result, which was uh, obtained essentially as a result of Alan Cohn's theory. A phenomenal algebra in a separable Hilbert space is injected if and only if it is approximately finite dimensional, which means that there is an increasing sequence of finite dimensional mat full matrix algebras within that algebra, which generate the algebra, okay? So not every algebra is injective, and we have a complete characterization of injective algebras. And this is really wonderful in some sense. Why? Because if you remember, I mentioned that in algebraic quantum field theory, the local algebras are type 3 uh, type 3, 1 algebras, which are hyperfinite as well. They are injective, therefore. So inject, and, and why is that important? You will see that this leads to, it, it has a, a physical, operational uh, significance, because then in that context, the extension, extendability of operations is ensured, at least for those local algebras that are 
higher requirement. Okay. Now I come to the issue of operation of C star and W star independence. This slide contains four definitions. The first definition is that uh, two local algebras are operationally C star independent in a larger algebra associated with the bounded space dimension. If any two normal operations, if any two operations, not normally in the first run, have a joint extension to an operation of the larger algebra. Okay. And they are called W star independent if any two normal operations have an extension to the normal operation of the larger and they're called C star independent in the product sense if the extension can be taken as a product. And they are called W star independent operationally in the product sense if the extension, the normal extension, can be taken to be normal. Okay. Can be taken to be a product. So four definitions of operational independence, operational C star, operational W star, operational C star in the product sense and operation of W star in the product sense. <coughs> Comments on this definition. First of all, I hope you find this definition very natural because again, it is designed on the same pattern. The, general, the same pattern as the other ones, namely the general core idea. What was the core idea, you remember? The core idea was that two subsystems of a larger system are independent if anything which is possible for one in its own right and anything which is possible for the other in its own right are jointly possible. Here's the idea. An operation for this, an operation for this, for that are co-possible as an operation on the large system. That's what operational independence expresses and expresses in the, in the natural sense that any two operations here and there have a joint extension to an operation on the large system. Okay. Now, yes? Um, in the previous uh, slide about uh, uh, injectivity. Injectivity. Um, you, okay, well, this is a good property for quantum uh, algebra field theory because uh, the operation can be extended. Yes. Uh, however, if we consider the uh, some uh, on M algebra and uh, sub algebra, and you have the normal operation for this uh, type of time. Uh, can you extend it for a normal operation? I don't know. Uh, you 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 and uh, you actually anticipated an issue which I was to raise. I don't know what the situation is. Uh, maybe that's just a, the limitation of my knowledge, I would very much like to know what the situation is. Um, I don't know. Okay. I suspect that the, an that the answer is no, mm -hmm. but I don't know for sure. So any of, if any of you operator or whatever specialist would know, mm -hmm. that would be very helpful. Uh, very you good, thank you. Because you, you told us that uh, this is very nice property for uh, yes. um, extension property of the power line. This is oh. Yeah, this is a problem. Okay. Uh, it's a very good, very important remark. You anticipated something crucial here. It comes up, I hope I can get to that. Uh, it's a crucial issue. Uh, not knowing the answer to that question of yours prohibits claiming certain operational independence to hold uh -huh. in a certain form mm -hmm. in algebraic quantum theory. Uh -huh. Thank you, this is very good. Thank you. Very good, very perceptive. Okay, so I, but I hope that you find this definition very natural, okay? It's the most natural thing you can think of. Uh, it's, it's really annoyingly natural. Okay, good, anyway, comments. States, I, I claim that states are special cases of operations, yet I claim that operational C star and W star independence are not special cases of C star and W star independence. This is a trivial remark, but it's good to keep in mind. Why? Well, because operational independence requires extensibility of a larger class of CP maps, not just states, but a larger class. But the extension is allowed to be in a larger class of CP maps too. So if there is no a priori prima facie relation between the two. As we saw, the C star and W star independence expresses 
that no that any two partial states are co-possible. The operational independence can be thought of as expressing that any two state transitions are co-possible. Because remember the dual of an operation acts in the state space. And so if operational independence holds, that means that any two state transitions defined by these uh, duals are co-possible. This is how you should uh, conceive of them. OK. Now here are some elementary results on operational C strike, W strike dependence, uh, which relate these two concepts to the uh, independence hierarchy I have flashed here. Namely that operational um, independence of operational C star independence of two C star algebras E1 and E2 in the generated uh, algebra and fail that the two are C star independent. So operational C star independence is stronger than C star independence. I didn't say it's strictly stronger, but I said it's stronger. Okay, uh, and this is in the case uh, uh, also for a W star independence and W star operational independence. Namely, if you have two mutually commuting von Neumann algebras in a separate Hilbert space, then operational W star independence of the two entails that the two are W star independent. So up the operational independence in C star and W star sense entails C star and W star independence. The next observation or proposition is that this pair of C star algebras are C star independent in the product sense, if and only if they are operationally C star independent in the product sense. And the same holds for the W star version of this. Okay. And knowing that C star independence, uh, how C star independence and W star independence relate to each other, we know that operational W star independence in the product sense entails operational C star independence in the product sense, but the converse is not true. So this is uh, what is known about uh, the issue. There is a little paper in the International Journal of Theoretical Physics where this, is, this can be read about. Here is a problem to which uh, I don't know the answer. Is it the case that operational C star and W star independence without the product assumption and pair W star and C star independence in the product sense? And I conjecture that the answer is no, but I don't have any counterexample at this point. Okay. So if you want to think about it, that would be important. Uh, I really think that it's not the case. Uh, the product assumption is very much needed to entail the W star independence and the C star independence in the product sense. Because but you know why this, you know the significance. The significance of that would be that if you have an operational condition for the tensor product uh, structure to be present, if it turned out to be the case that operational C star and W star independence without the product assumption entail the uh, C star and W star independence in the product sense, because we know that the W star independence in the product sense and pairs uh, the tensor <coughs> product structure is equivalent to it in the case of commuting algebras. So no counterexample is known, but I think the conjecture is true. More generally, what is the relation of the operation of C star and W star independence to the other notions of the, of the independence hierarchy? Uh, nothing has been done in that connection. You might ask all sorts of questions about the uh, relationship, and this has not been done. So here is the hierarchy again, with the insertion of operational W star independence and operational C star independence here. And uh, you might want to ask about the arrows, uh, the other arrows, which are missing uh, here. Good. A remark about the injectivity issue. Um, you recall that the uh, von Neumann algebras were defined operationally independent in a given algebra. 
Uh, and this is very important because of, of the fact which I pointed out that operations on subalgebras are not necessarily extendable. Excuse me. Yes. About the injectivity. Uh, there is a counterexample that's normal use the map cannot be extended to as a normal use of map. Wonderful. Really? Uh, so there is an answer to your question then. I, I would very much like to know the reference. Uh, yeah, actually, it's very famous. If you take a hyperbinary to a factor to consider an identity map to itself, and consider this hyperbinary to a factor as a subalgebra of B of H, this is a context. I see. OK. Please, reference. Thank you for all the references. We have been corresponding. Uh, well, it is a one-sided correspondence to some extent. I hope you don't mind if I disclose this here. We had some little discussions after the lectures. And uh, I asked, uh, what's your name? Sorry. Uh, Ivo Ando. Ivo? That's the Ando. Ando? Yeah. I asked Ando to send me some references, and she he did. Uh, it's there in my inbox. It's very useful. Thank you very much. I do appreciate uh, very much that. Uh, uh, reference as well. And this answers your question. The, the answer is no, which means that uh, indeed, in that particular situation which I'm going to present you, it's not trivial what the status of a certain independence condition is in, in quantum field here. Maybe the top is star independence. It's not clear. Good, wonderful, thank you. So uh, this is the comment, this is what we have just talked about. Uh, injectivity so is sufficient but not necessary in general to ensure a necessary but not sufficient condition for operation of dependence uh, for the two subalgebras in the large algebra of the whole. So the hyperfiniteness, uh, which is injectivity of local algebras in field theory, can be interpreted as a sufficient condition that ensures a necessary condition for operation of the system and as the whole for local algebras in one to three theory. And this gives us some hope that C star and W star independence holds in one to three theory indeed. And uh, this is what I claim here not here in this case. So I present you a, a couple of propositions. So for that purpose, let's just assume that we have a net of local for Neumann algebra in the Hilbert space which satisfy the standard axioms of quantum free theory and consider two double cones, D1, D2, and the double cone D, which contains both double cones. And then the following holds this pair of phenomenal algebras, which again are associated with space-like separated double cones, are operationally C star independent, even in the product sense, in the algebra which is associated with the double cone that contains the two double cones. And injectivity is crucial in this. Because, because what you no, is that these two algebras generate the tensor product if they are space-like separated then uh, then that's the case and then sister independence holds for that and then in from the generated uh, tensor product you can extend the operation to the double code because the double code uh, is injected. The double cone algebra is injected. So again, you consider two strictly space-like separated space-time regions, double cones, and the large double cone which contains both. Then operational independence in the C star sense holds for this pair in the Neumann algebra which is associated with that double cone. And this is because, and I also give in my unit proof, because these two are, because they are strictly space-like separated, they have the split property, they actually have uh, the generated for nine, the generated for nine algebra is isomorphic to the 
tensor product, and then uh, operational independence falls in the tensor product, and from the tensor product you can extend the operation to the cone, uh, to the double cone algebra, because the double cone algebra is in general. So this is good. I hope you are you are satisfied. You, at this point, you should be relieved. Okay, here's a very natural independence condition, and it holds where it is supposed to hold, namely for the case of strictly space-like separated problems. Okay. Another proposition that these two are operationally doppista independent in the product sense in the generated von Neumann algebra, which is isomorphic to the tensor product because they are doppista independent in the product sense as well, because the split property holds. And then here's the question are they also doppista independent in the product sense in the large cone? And to this, I don't know the answer, because in, I was asking, is injectivity of MD enough? And clearly, it's not enough. At right, it's not enough, right? Um, and here, here, was, here was my question out of ignorance. Is injectivity of C sufficient to entail that the normal CP from a subalgebra are extendable to a normal CP? And the answer to the question is no. And therefore, it's not trivial whether the doggy style independence holds in the product sense in the way it, it holds for a w for C star independence for the codes. Uh, uh, I, I knew the negative uh, answer for the more general case. I very famous because, for this one. Yeah, yeah, because for example, the uh, maximal abelian subalgebra uh, uh, <coughs> for L2. Uh, L2 equal space, you consider B over. And yes. then uh, sister algebra generated by essentially bounded metrical function uh, is very infinite space. And uh, the infinite algebra is uh, maximal abelian for Neumann subalgebra of B over in this case. Yes. And it is very well known that there is no uh, normal condition expectation from B of H on to uh, very infinite. I see. And uh, this is normal function expectation is naturally the, just the extension of the identity muscle from the very infinity to uh, very infinity inside the field. And so the, this uh, say that the identity map on the L infinity uh, cannot be extended normal. Uh, I see. But it's That's very similar to the type of one case. It's almost the same. It's almost uh, the same. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Can, can I? This is very classical, uh, maybe 1960. I see. Uh, I would very much like to have the reference for it because I've, you see that I was just ignorant here, um, and it's it's a very very important. I learned now an awful lot. Actually, I've learned an awful lot. Uh, really. Um, so thank. I, I would very much have like to have this it is some standard reference. Even in uh, Alderson's paper. Uh, I see. In the 1960s. Thank you, thank you. Good. Uh, so now you see, uh, you see, you see what you see. <laughs> that is to say, uh, here's a problem uh, to which I don't know the answer. And, and what you have just told me, what you have just clarified, makes the, uh, the problem really a problem. Good. So this is just a picture of the situation. Here are the two space-like separated double cones, strictly space-like separated regions. And these, for these, operational C star independence holds beautifully. Operational W star independence does not hold in the sense that, that these two are not independent to W star sense in the large cone which they, which contains them. Okay. Next, I'd like to turn to a related independence notion, which is called operational separability. For this, is some preparation, some terminology. If you have a local system, if you have a local net in the sense of field theory, 
uh, and you have two regions, V1 and V2, and a large one which contains them, then this thing here I call a local system, namely the algebras associated with these regions, a state on the large algebra, and an operation on the large system. So, okay. I just call this a local <coughs> system. And I will say that this T on the large, this operation on the large system represents an operation on the source small system if that T is an extension of an operation on, say, one of the systems. Okay? Because of the non-extendability of operations we have discussed, it is, this, it is not trivial that an operation on the large system represents an operation which is carried out on the small system. If it is the case, if this large T is an extension of an operation on the small system, then I say that that operation represents an operation carried out on the small system. Okay. Now, if you have a situation, uh, a local system, in which uh, the operation T on the large system represents an operation on the small system, then, of course, you can consider the state change in the large system, which is caused by performing this operation T. Okay. Now, even if this represents an operation on the small system, then this, of course, entails that if you perform that operation on the large system, that will change any given state by one of the small system into a definite other state. V star phi 1. But this doesn't entail that the change caused by that T on the large system is such that if you restrict the large system state to the other system, then that restriction coincides with that system state before the operation has been carried out. You see that? So again, you have a large system, and you have an operation on the large system, which represents an operation which was carried out here. Now, the operation on the large system changes the large system state. It changes the small system state, all right, but it changes the large system state as well. And you can ask the question whether the large system state restricted to that system has changed from what it was before the operation was carried out. And you cannot expect necessarily that that is uh, not a change. That is to say that that operation did not change the state of that system. Okay, But if it is the case, then you say that that system, that local system, was operationally separated. So precisely, this system is called operationally separated in the following forms. The operation condition state, this state of the large system, coincides with the original system on AV2 if T is an extension of an operation on AV1. And it coincides with AV1 if T is an extension of an operation on AV2. In other words, I call the system operationally separated if that operation, if it represents an operation that was carried out here, leaves that system in that end. And if it just represents an operation which was uh, carried out here, leaves that system state in that end. Okay? This is the case, then I call the system operationally separated. Uh, this operational separateness is a kind of no signal requirement via the operation. It means that an interaction measurement operation with system AV1 or with AV2 does not change the state of the remote system <coughs> AV2 or the remote system AV1. So this is the uh, abstract formulation of a uh, no signaling via an operation. The idea goes back to Einstein, just the historical remark here. Einstein, when he criticized classical uh, standard quantum mechanics, he, he pointed out that it violated somehow this operational separated condition. This is what he writes. 
If one asks what is characteristic of the realm of physical ideas independently of the quantum theory, then above all, the following attracts our attention. The concepts of physics refer to a real external world. That is to say, ideas are posited of things that claim a real existence independent of the perceiving subject, body, field, and so on. And these ideas are, on the other hand, brought into as secure a relationship as possible with sense impressions. Moreover, it is characteristic of these physical things that they are conceived of as being arranged in a space-time space continuum. Further, it appears to be essential for this arrangement of the things introduced in physics that at a specific time, these things claim an existence independent of one another insofar as these things lie in different parts of space. And let me just shorten this. Field theory has carried out this principle to the extreme in that it localizes within infinitely small four-dimensional space elements the elementary things existing independently of one another. And for the relative independence of spatially distant things, this idea is characteristic. An external influence on A has no immediate effect on B. This is known as the principle of local action, which is applied consistently only in field theory. So what Einstein says is here, here essentially that in, in the field theoretical paradigm, operational separatedness should be the place. This is what I claim how one should read Einstein's 1930, 48 words. This is from the famous paper, One Quantum Mechanics and Reality. It's originally in German. OK. Uh, but that was just a historical remark that the, the idea of operational separateness goes back to Einstein's 1948 criticism of ordinary quantum mechanics. Now, does this operational separateness hold in quantum field theory? We would expect it to be the case. Well, for certain operations, it does hold. You see immediately that if the operation is given by cross operators belonging to either AD1 or AD2, then the local system is operationally separated for every state. Well, why? Well, because, of course, local commutativity holds, and this is a crucial explanation or crucial motivation for local commutativity. And the cross operators sum up to one, and the cross operators in one algebra, they commute with the other, so there's no measurement disturbance, there's no signaling. Local commutativity excludes no excludes signaling, and this is uh, the motivation why the standard motivation as to why local commutativity is an independence condition. But we have seen that general operations are not given by cross operators. So it's not entirely clear, not immediately clear, whether no signaling theorem is true for general operators, operations. Is a no signaling theorem true for all operations? It's a very natural question. What do you think? <laughs> I, I have some opinion that Okay, I, I'll need to, before you say something, okay. I would like to ask the, the students whether they have any intuition. You do see that this is a problem. This is a very natural question, okay? Cross op oper operations given by local cross operators don't violate the no signaling. How about general operations? It's not easy to guess, right? Anyway, since we are running out of time, let me just give, give you the floor. Do you have any view, view on that? Of course you know, yeah, because we have... My mind is that the uh, notion of the general pressure should be restricted to uh, mathematically representable by cross representation, or we say that the physical operation should be in a uh, stigma. I see. Okay, well, if you take that position, I'm not sure I, I, I agree with that, but if you take that position, then of course, the question is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I don't think it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, uh, I'm presenting you with some, uh, some proposition. The answer to that question mm -hmm. is no. 
uh, there is a no no signaling proposition for operations. This is in a little paper which we wrote with Giovanni Valente in 2012. For every local system in quantum field theory, where the state is a faithful normal state, there exists an operation such that the local system is not operationally separated. Now, should we, what, what, what should we do then? First of all, you realize that the condition that the, for any local system for which the state is faithful is not really a very strong one. There are lots and lots of faithful states. Local states are typically faithful. So the violation of the no signaling is not atypical. And the other commentary is that, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, the local commutativity requirement is not strong enough to exclude signaling for general operators, operations. Um, and I also have here to comment that uh, the operation which violates the you no know, signaling is the is a particular one which we could find, but there could be other ones, and I think it's a reasonable question to ask what operations have this property? Can you characterize those operations somehow which have this feature? Can you classify them in any way? Now, of course, if you have the view that only cross representable operations are physically meaningful, then this is not really physically relevant. Anyway, what can we do? What are the options in view of this no, no signal situation? Well, you can conclude that the notion of operation in this generality is incompatible with the locality and causality as it is expressed in quantum field theory. And this, I think, would be a major conceptual philosophical tension in the theory, because that theory, as I claimed in the very beginning, if you remember, uh, is viewed by the physicist, and I think for good reason, as the theory which expresses and embodies is compatible with the causality intuition we have on the basis of the special theory of relativity. So that would be uh, somehow against our intuition. Uh, or you can say that these operations, as this, this is Professor Zawa's position, these operations are just unphysical. Okay, because all operations should be in, in, a, in, in, in that sense of, of being representable by Krauss operators. A problem, a possible problem with that. Uh, with that position is that you would then have to, uh, to defend the position that the uh, physicality in that sense is attractive uh, on some other grounds. Can this be done? Maybe it can be done. I don't really know. I have not thought of this. But another position is which I have thought about is that you can weaken the notion of operation and separation in such a way that the weakening is conceptually motivated, acceptable, and attractive intuitively, and that the weakened position can be proven uh, to hold for all operations under reasonable conditions. And I'd like to explain how this can be done in the remaining of this lecture. I call uh, a local system operationally separable, not separated, but separable, if the following is true. If it is operationally separated, there is no problem with that then from, from the perspective of causality. Or if it is not operationally separated, then, and T is an extension of an operation on A, B, let's say, then there exists an other operation, T prime, which coincides with the original operation T on A, B, 1, and <coughs> for which the system is operationally separated. That is to say, if it is restrictive, the, that the disturbance is restricted to the subsystem on which the operation was performed. So the idea here is that maybe the, this causally bad behavior, the failure of operational separation of the local system here, is due to the fact that the operation T, which represents a local operation on AB1 or AB2, just happen to be a causally bad representative, and then you can choose another representative which coincides with the original one, one where it was performed, 
and which is causally bad behavior. So the causal bad, causal bad behavior is curable somehow. That's the idea. If an operation is causally badly behaved, maybe I can replace it by another one which is causally all right and which coincides with the original operation on the local system. That's the idea. And I claim that, well, that's reasonable. And certainly, a quantum field theory should be operationally separable, at least if it is to be accepted as a theory which is compatible with uh, the intuition of causality on the basis of special theory of relativity. Now, a small remark, of course, one can distinguish operational separability in the C star sense, in the W star sense, depending on whether you require the operations to be normal or not. So you have two sorts of operational separability, the C star and the W star. And the question is, what is the relation of them? And I don't really know what the answer to that is. I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is. There are two notions of operational separability. Are they equivalent? Are they not equivalent? I don't know. This is relatively new, so I have not been able to say anything about it. <clears throat> and, OK, the next, before we go on, uh, you, you now ask the question whether quantum field theory local systems are such that they are operationally separable. You would want this to be the case. I claim that this is the case. Operational separability actually holds, typically, for local systems. And the way to show that is to relate this operational separability to operational independence. That's what I'm going to do. Here's a little proposition. It's trivial, really. If the pair is operational C star independent, that algebra, then for every phi and every operation, this local system is operationally separable. And the same goes for the double version of these of this claims. Um, so local systems in algebraic quantum field theory are operationally separable if operational independence holds in algebraic quantum field theory. And we have seen that it does, at least in the C star sense. <coughs> Typically, in the W star sense, it's not entirely clear. So the, the state of the matter is uh, the following proposition, which is the corollary of what I already presented here. If you have local von Neumann algebras associated with strictly space-like separated double cone regions in a local net satisfying the axioms, and D is a double cone containing D1 and D2, then this local system is operationally C star separable for every phi and D. Is the W star version of the above also true? Uh, we don't know because we don't know what the status of the W star operational independence is in quantum theory for the reasons we discussed. <coughs> it's unclear whether the uh, operations which are normal are extendable to the double form, to the large double form, that we don't know. It poss poss probably it is not the case. OK. So um, I could actually finish here, but uh, there is a little twist on these notions. And I think I should, I should finish here, going jumping to the summary. There's an extra twist on the notions of operational separability and operational independence, which I don't have time to detail. I think it's quite understandable if you read the slides if you're interested in them. So I suggest, because we are running out of time, that I jump to the conclusion uh, and uh, just summarize what the situation is now. And again, I make the slides available, and you will see in what way one can even specify the operational independence and operational separability notions into some subclasses. And there are open problems about that, but I don't have time to compare them. So let me just jump to the uh, conclusion then, or the summary. I think I have convinced you that 
there is indeed a rich hierarchy of interdependent, non-equivalent independence notions. And they are formulated in algebraic one mechanics using the theory of concepts and terminology of operator algebras, uh, C star and W star algebras. And a particular version of that independence uh, concept is operational independence. It's a physically very natural independence concept expressing the idea that any two operations which you can perform on two subsystems of a large system are jointly realizable as a single operation on the large system. And this operational independence uh, concept can be given technically different formulations in terms of uh, CP maps. And they fit also very naturally into the hierarchy of other independence notions with open questions about them. And these operational separability and independence conditions uh, express the compatibility of the notion of operation with relativistic causality and locality. So uh, the unit deserving completely positive maps as operations don't pose any particular problem from the perspective of the logical incompatibility of this notion of the causality as understood and expressed in global one physics. And both operational independence and operational separability calls for typical local algebras in quantum field theory. As we have seen, they hold for double cones which are strictly space-like separated. Uh, at least in the C star sense, they hold without any problem. For the W star sense, it's not entirely clear whether they hold for this because of this continuity problem. And then you might want to ask, what's the situation when they are not strictly space-like separated by tangent? Well, then they don't. I, I remain silent about that. The situation is not clear in that case. We have seen that the situation of function double points is very crazy anyway, because remember how the value in equality behave in that particular situation. So that's a problematic uh, case for which I didn't claim anything about operational independence and operational separability. So there's a lot to be done still, and you are very welcome to discuss any of the issues with me, either the remaining uh, time here in Nagoya or in correspondence or in any other ways. So with this, I would like to thank you for your patience, attention, for your comments. You've been a wonderful audience, and I have had a great time, and I have also learned a lot. And I'd like to thank Professor Osaba once more for organizing this series of lectures and inviting me here to Nagoya. Thank you very much. And there is a discussion in the afternoon, right? Uh, in, the, in another room, right? Yes, you can do that. Yeah. When, when do we start?